May we have your attention, please? You're listening to Tales from the Tannoy with Eleanor Hamilton. When you catch a bus, a train, or put your shopping through the self-checkout at the supermarket, or use a smart speaker or sat-nav, someone nearly always talks to you. Sometimes they're a bit annoying, and sometimes you barely notice them. But they're always there, following you around. If you stand on some of the platforms on the London Underground, you'll hear me telling you what to do. For safety and security reasons, please do not leave your personal belongings unattended. And my husband, Phil, says... Mind the gap. Even though he died in 2016, I love that we are, as far as I know, the only married couple on the transport network making announcements together still, while one of us is dead. As long as his voice remains, so does he. You can hear about us in episode one, but in Tales from the Tannoy, I've spoken to heaps of people who have incredible stories, and for the most part, we know their voices really well. But we don't need to know their names, and we certainly didn't know anything about their background until now. In this episode, you could kind of say we're wombling. I'm heard underground across London, but my counterpart overground is Emma Hignett, and she's heard on all the London buses. So it's a kind of London transport special. Change for bus routes 427 and 607 towards Uxbridge, Southall and Ealing. And Emma, you sound like the average, well-spoken, sensible lady on the bus who will calmly direct passengers to their destination. But as a teenager, you came down to London to follow an entirely different career, didn't you? Yeah. I always wanted to dance, and I went through school wanting to dance, and so after my O-levels, that shows how old I am, (laughs) I went off to ballet school for three years. Our final year at dance school, the idea was that we would do a performance at the end of our third year and that agents would come and the like, and Mm. you'd all get wonderful careers. Um, uh, But the the college had a, a management crisis about just coming to the end of the sort of second term of that year, so two-thirds of the way through, Mm. and cancelled the final year show. Oh. So we're like, so what are we here for now? Because we've done all our exams. We've, You know, I was qualified to teach dance. I'd done all that bit. Mm. And somebody else who'd been in the year above had just signed up to get a contract overseas as a dancer. And the whole quest at that point was you had to get a full equity card because then, you know, everything opened up to you. You could apply for any dancing job. And so she called up some of us and said, look, they're looking for more dancers on this particular job. And so, was it four more of us? Three more of us? Three more of us, I think, Mm. went down to London and had a random interview in a cafeteria in King's Cross Station. Right. Um, They didn't see us dance. Uh, (laughs) And and, So even I could have gone for it. Yeah. (laughs) And basically, they signed us up to head off to um, dance with Circo Magico Italiano, touring Mexico for nine months. Wow. My dad said to me on the way down, I must have phoned him before I went down. I'm I'm saying on the way down. No, we didn't have mobile phones in those days, did we? Mm. I must have phoned him before I went for the audition meeting thing. And he was like, we really think you shouldn't do it. We really think you shouldn't do it. And so I phoned the back and went, oh, I'm doing it. (laughs) So I was 18. And at some point in June, I, I got on a plane from Gatwick Airport with, there were 18 Brits went, I was one of four who'd come from my college. Um, So there were two blokes, two blokes and 16 girls, and off we went. (laughs) But the blokes were delighted, although, you know, if there were dancers, they may not have been. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Might not have been their cup of tea. No, I think think girls were their cup of tea, those two. Um, And I think, do you know what? You know, we all... uh, in many ways, had a whale of a time. We all, mm. You were never alone. There were so many of you. Um, we travelled round, so you, you, you sort of... It was, it was a great way to do it because you didn't sort of pitch up and you, there's your roommate and you're together for nine months and you're tearing your hair out. You know, we'd go to a different hotel. We could get six people in this room. It's cheaper for us, right? Every, you know, everybody in. Um, so you'd change who you were with every week in a different hotel. And and I think that kept it quite sort of relaxed and, you know, yeah, and, and everybody alive. got on pretty well for nine months. But boy, what an experience. That's amazing. Because, I mean, I must say that thinking about your dad's reaction, um, when your kid says that they're going to run away and join a circus, most parents <laughs> are probably not very pleased about it. Yeah, I think 
It was harder for my parents, and I only found that out years later, because I was off on the adventure. Um, You know, it was the days before the internet and before emails and before FaceTime and before Facebook and before mobile phones. So, And because I always had this thing of being fiercely independent, so I was earning. Therefore, I would phone home when I could afford to phone home, which actually wasn't what they wanted. They wanted me to phone home every fortnight. And... So then I didn't phone home for a few weeks and my mum and dad were just panicking and panicking and panicking. And then I had my visa card nicked. So I had to phone home to get them to cancel it. Um, And so they were like... Suddenly you wanted to phone home. That's a fairly (laughs) typical teenager. Yeah. So then I was, yeah. But then they were sort of like, you phone every fortnight. So I used to Mm -hmm. phone and reverse the charges once a fortnight (laughs) um, from then on. A dutiful daughter. But... um. Yeah, it was it was a bizarre experience when you look back on it. But yes, I did run away to the circus. And, you know, so therefore you know, I have one child and I cannot deny him at any, you know, I, I keep coming back to the point, well, I ran away to the circus. What am I supposed to say? Yeah. You know, I, I can't say, I really wish I'd gone to university in retrospect because... I had the freedom to go and do the mad things. So what kind of performing did you do over there? I was a showgirl. Wow. Sounds very glamorous, Mm. wasn't it? Well, I I suppose it has to look glamorous. I mean, we used to joke, you know, the whole thing was that you were to look attractive and they they had, they marketed this circus as having 25 bellezas internacionales, which is 25 international beauties. And and then they, they... 18 of whom were, well, 16. Well, I don't think we can class the two, class the two boys as international beauties. 16 of them were British and there I were some know. Mexican, maybe, <laughs> Mexican dancers as well. And they, they used to go on and on about our English rose uh, complexion and everything. We weren't allowed to sunbathe and all this kind of stuff. Really? And the, I suppose the whole idea was that you provide an appeal to a segment of the audience while also entertaining. Um, It was serious choreography. We had a really good choreographer. It was serious dancing, you know, two, three shows a day. But some of that serious dancing you were doing in three-inch heels with a massive pack of feathers on your back and a two-foot headdress on your head. Um, (laughs) And and yes, you are wearing bikinis, but believe me, it does not feel in the slightest bit provocative or really? sexy. <laughs> Not in the slightest. Because actually, you know, all the guff you're wearing is quite heavy and it's quite cumbersome. And you try doing, you know, three turns when you've got six foot of feathers trailing from your shoulders. And, and you know, you'll probably come out of it fine, but the person next to you gets whacked across the face if you do it wrong. <laughs> um, so it was quite a skill to learn. It sounds um, like it. Do you know what? I I was I became dance captain. I was the youngest one, um, but I um, spoke Spanish, which probably helped. Mm. So I became dance captain. And when we were rehearsing, the first person they put feathers on for the rehearsal was me. And I'd never danced with feathers before. Some of them had. Mm. And so there's one person wearing feathers and all these other dancers, and they were getting whiplashed by my <laughs> feathers left, right and centre. <laughs> And then you very quickly learn how to dance with feathers, to be perfectly honest. So with it being a circus rather than um, entertainment in hotels or what have you, Mm -hmm. was it that you were performing to a local audience? In a big top. A massive, massive big top, but with a stage, not a ring circus. Uh So we had a stage that we performed um, and we, you know, by by the end of your last show, which was normally on a Sunday night in one town, um, the sides of the tent were off and literally the audience would be out and the whole thing would be down and dismantled within minutes. Um, and off you go to the next town and they put it up and off we'd go again. You know, I can still picture it. There was four trailers onto the backstage area, which were the changing rooms, um, and then another trailer, which was the costume store, and there were lions and tigers. Sometimes we had elephants with us. They weren't used on the stage. They went on parade. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the, the the other acts with animals, we had dogs in one act, but I'm sure they were. But the lions and tigers, I know it's really contentious and I do not agree with it now. And I, I, But the guy who cared for the lions and tigers, he adored them and they visually, you could tell, you just could see that they adored him. Right. 
But then when you've seen a, a, a tiger out cold on a table at the back of the circus having a tooth removed, it's a strange thing. <laughs> that is. <laughs> Don't mind me. Just it's get your feathers on. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, and, and it's completely wrong, and I know that now, but we're going back to the 80s and there wasn't the the awareness or the campaigns. Um, and I was in Mexico and, you know, it, 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 their take on these things is very different. That said... I've mentioned that the the guy really, you know, these animals adored the guy who looked after them and he adored them and he really cared for them and he did the act on stage with them um, most nights. By the way, they did put a big cage up. <laughs> so right. they put a big cage on the stage and then they'd put a, a, a tunnel of cages across backstage and they'd lift these things up and, and the lions and tigers would run onto the stage right. and do their show. The owner of the circus was quite a formidable and scary man who had been a lion tamer before he'd started running circuses. And every now and then he'd just go, right, I'm doing the act tonight. And off the lions and tigers would go and they would do the act with, the guy was called Franco. They would do the act with Franco and then it would come to the next show and they would not go on the stage. Really? That's yeah. interesting. And that was when it got horrible because they would hit them to get them on the stage. Oh. But, mm. You know, um, but they weren't daft. And that makes it even more clear that they shouldn't be caged. Yes. Wow. Heartbreaking. <laughs> yeah, it is heartbreaking. Um, but I go back to the fact that they adored the guy who looked after them. He had a real bond with them. Yeah. Well, that's good. That, yeah. That makes yeah. me feel slightly better. So, yeah, so they must have had some <laughs> degree of, you know, they enjoyed working with him. Yeah, yeah. But, well, that's, that's But, you know, you. the life they knew was not good. No. Really. No. But you came home. After I came that. home. Yes, I didn't marry a Mexican or anything like that. Oh, um, disappointing. <laughs> I didn't. So, do you know what? So halfway around, somebody said to me, "Oh, because I did. I, I did date the juggler for a while." And halfway around, <laughs> I don't know why that's, funny. that's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> halfway, halfway through the tour, I remember somebody saying to me, "Oh, I could see you living in a caravan behind the the circus," and I thought, "Oh, that's mm. not really how I envisage my future." No. <laughs> Fun so, yes. for a while, but maybe <laughs> the, not forever. At the end of that, I came home. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So um, I, I, I danced on a few more contracts uh, uh, and then I, I was having problems with my knees. And I was also finding that dancing, the working type of dancing was far less challenging and required far less, I don't know, input and and. and it just didn't feel like it had felt at college. It didn't feel the chat. You weren't pushing yourself. You were mm. literally just... Going through the motions? Yeah, being yeah. the entertainment on the stage. Yeah. And it was all a bit vacuous. And so I decided to give it up. And whilst I'd been at college, um, my dad had said to me, oh, I can see you on the telly reading the news one day. And that had stuck in my head. And I thought, I'd always thought when I gave up dancing or to whatever age I would give up dancing, I would see if I could get into telly. Right. And as you do. As you do, yeah. <laughs> I think I'll try that, OK. Yeah, this, this sort of, yeah, this sort of blind confidence that, well, that's my next job. What's your yeah. next job? Yeah, I'm going to do this. And at the time, it had been fairly well publicised that some people had got into television through a secretarial route, got right. into the BBC working as a secretary. And, um, and so I was like, right, well, I'm going to get myself secretarial Mm. Uh, in the days when they still had secretaries. So I trained and did a quick secretarial course and I went down to London and I worked as a secretary and um, and I thought, right, and the other way in, of course, is to do a bit of radio. So I started mm. doing amateur radio. Right. And found radio. Mm. And having been a child who didn't really grow up in love with radio, we used to listen to the chart show. My parents listened to Terry Wogan in the morning, but I hadn't, I didn't know radio. I'd not really ever fallen for it. And then I discovered radio and I loved it. I absolutely loved radio. And and so I pursued that far more than I ever pursued trying to get onto the telly. I did breakfast shows for most of my time in radio. And you're given the most opportunity to to portray yourself and your life through what you say on the radio. And certainly when I was, I did Red Dragon in Cardiff for about five years on the breakfast show with a wonderful guy called Jason Harold. Mm. And everybody in the town 
knew my entire life. It was disastrous for my love life because everybody <laughs> knew me. No man would go near me for fear that I told the whole of Cardiff the next day. <laughs> so, so I was, I was single forever because Aww. of it. But it was amazing. It was amazing. Mm. It was the best radio I ever made and I was very proud of it. And at one point you, you worked with Jerry Springer. <laughs> I did work with Jerry Springer. <laughs> Tell that me all about that, because I remember when um, when I was probably in my teens, he was massive. I don't know whether that was before or after. Um... This was 2003, 2004. That's after he'd had his, his huge success on the television, because it must have been in the 90s that he was big and everybody was watching his, his show. Yeah, but he was monumentally famous. Mm. Uh, you know, around the world at that point, he was monumentally famous. And I think he... He liked an, a good excuse to come back to the UK, and it was Capital Gold in London. Right. And they managed to persuade him to come back and do drive time for a week. And I was the only female on the station at the time. And so they said, would I co-host with him? So I co-hosted with Jerry Springer for a week, and it was fascinating. And, and, and mm. you know, he was a very different person from that person portrayed on the Jerry Springer show. Yes. He was... You didn't decide to have a fight with the newsreader or something no, just to see what... No, he, he didn't <laughs> fight anybody. Um, he was nice. He was very into politics. He was great company. But this is the thing I remember about Jerry. Before the show, when you were planning what you were doing in your show and you were walking, it was a very long corridor to the studio, and you'd you'd plan together and you'd walk along the corridor together and we'd be like, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, and, blah, blah, blah. and we'd do the show and we'd, he would be focused absolutely on what was happening at that time in the studio, what was going on, et cetera, et cetera. The moment that show finished, he switched off. And his brain switched on to the next thing he was doing. And I didn't exist any longer. Wow. And I could walk back down the same corridor with him and he would literally drop the door in my face, the swing door. It, it was the... Every day it was exactly the same. He just... That's it, it's over. And he obviously was onto something else. So it wasn't an unkindness, it was just no, kind of... it was a focus. It was wow. an unbelievable focus. It was odd. It was, I'd never, I've never come across it since. I'd never come across it before, but it was, you know, it was a strange thing to kind of witness. Yeah. But he was, you know, he was, he was a lovely guy and he, it was a, a real privilege to, to just be thrown into that madness for a week. Yeah. I guess not many people have, can say that they've, they've worked with Jerry Springer, not in a positive way anyway. I mean, they might have sort of ended up on his show being screamed at by some yeah. awful relative. But um. but he sort of <laughs> distanced himself from that. It was sort of the way the, the show had evolved to make it famous many in many ways. And he kind of distanced himself from it. But um, I do wonder, do you know what, if I somehow met him now or even just engaged with him on Twitter, mm. you get the feeling he probably wouldn't even remember me. So if he got on a bus in London, he would go, oh, it's my mate Emma. <laughs> I suspect not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a shame. <laughs> I don't, I, I, it's fine. It's my, you know, I know I did it. <laughs> yeah. I didn't, you know. Nobody believes you, but it's... No. <laughs> I've got there one recording? photo somewhere. Have you? Oh, well, that's all right. <laughs> no recordings, though. <laughs> I probably have got recordings somewhere. Yeah. I'm sure I do, but the, you know, things like all those recordings in those days were on cassettes. Yes, <laughs> or, or I know. At best, CDs. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I interviewed Brad Pitt at one point. And I, You're I did, kidding. Oh, I did interview Brad Pitt. <gasps> And uh, I still I, that that I've transferred to digital. <laughs> I bet you did. <laughs> I interviewed Brad Pitt and Joseph Fiennes on the same day. Wow, Joseph, Joseph Fiennes was gorgeous. I bet he oh. was. Yeah, actually, I think I'd rather you know. Brad, Brad Pitt didn't do it for me. No, no. I think he'd had enough of interviews. I was the last one, mm. and he gave me a one-word answer to every question I had. I had. <sighs> Six or seven minutes. I mean, literally, they started the stopwatch. Mm. And I had two pages of questions. And I was like, ah, oh, this will be fine. This will mm. be fine. He gave me a one-word answer to every question. Okay. I was through it all in about 40 seconds. I was like, oh, <laughs> what a shame. I think he'd had a bad day. Yeah, quite possibly. But yeah. maybe you should have turned up any feathers. Well, do you know, it's funny you should say that. Um, I do remember, because it was at the, it was at, oh, one of those posh hotels in London which one was it one of the ones on Park Lane mm. is it the Dorchester I think it is 
And, you know, there's this sort of pooling area of everybody who's turned up to interview him. So there's somebody from the BBC, you know, you recognise them all. There's BBC News and there's Blue Peter and, and you know, and, and This Morning and whatever. And I recognise them all. And I remember saying to my producer, I remember what I was wearing. I was wearing jeans and a black shirt, long sleeve mm. shirt. And I remember saying to my producer, I am distinctly overdressed for this, aren't I? <laughs> there were a lot of boobs out, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and I, was like, I can't imagine why. Do they really think they're going to pull him? <laughs> <laughs> Look, you know, if you can't try. I know. Well, yes. Yeah. Yes. I was obviously just too naive. You, you probably know. were. Or either, either that or I was, I, I must have been focused on some other man at the time and not, <laughs> not, not on the pull. <laughs> oh, brilliant. So when you left, you left London, went up to the North East. Mm. I came up to the northeast to run a radio station. Right. Um, uh, changes in radio was made redundant, um, mm. went into public relations. Right. But at the point where I came up um, to the northeast was at the point where I'd just done the demo for the London buses job. Mm. And I got the job. So I then was going flitting back to London once a fortnight to record all the bus stops. Yeah. Um, no, and I met my husband... Oh, about two years, two years later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, husband right. to be. He wasn't for, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I didn't think you'd gone straight yeah. into it. But, I, didn't, you know. I didn't go for one of those, you know, meet <laughs> and marry on the same day TV programmes kind of thing. <laughs> so there with your history, I wouldn't have put it past you. <laughs> I know. I, know you wouldn't be, I used to be so prim. <laughs> <laughs> but do you know what? The funny thing about you is that you do kind of, your voice does sound quite prim in, in a lovely way. And and the thing is that when, you know, when we've met in the past, you've always seemed so normal. And um, <laughs> and the idea that you've actually been a showgirl and, and, and what have you, and worked with Jerry Springer and uh, not got your tits out in front of Brad Pitt and all this kind of, <laughs> you know, that's the bit, the only, the only bit that I can believe actually. Um, but I remember having a conversation with you a few weeks ago. We were talking about the way that they'd picked your voice, the selection process mm. of your voice, which is really interesting because the word that you used, which I wouldn't have particularly used, but I understand what you're trying to say, is that they picked you because you sounded bland. And Well, that was um, the word the PR girl used. <laughs> she went, oh gosh, I don't mean it. But it is that. And, and then she qualified it by saying, you're not going to offend anybody. Exactly. And that is why you are so popular as the voice of the buses and why, yeah. why you, 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 because, and, and I know that Phil was picked for a very similar reason because yeah. it tells you everything that you need to know, but you're never going to listen to it and go, I wish she'd shut up. Yeah. That voice is on it. You, you know, there's nothing annoying about your voice. Um, but I just I've find that. i said that the best thing is there isn't a Facebook group that hates me. <laughs> That's about and that, I've said it in public now, so the yeah. part, somebody will set one up. Um, <laughs> I'll set it up. <laughs> Gee, thanks. No, I can return that favour. <laughs> no, <I know. laughs> no, that's really interesting, actually, because I know that there are, uh, I mean... I know there have been Facebook groups complaining about, you know, voices on some systems. Yes. And I'm not thinking of public transport, I'm thinking of uh, uh, something else, but... Yeah, know. all over. Yeah. And, and actually, I think that we, we can all agree that we hear voices out there in, in the great wide world and think, mm, maybe yeah. you could have picked a professional to do that, especially yeah. if you're going to be using it so much. Yeah. Um, or you could have yes, picked a bland would... one that wouldn't wind people up. <laughs> yeah. I'm available, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> we will raise our hand. <laughs> Hey, we could, uh, you know, go for the next job by having some kind of mud fight with feathers. <laughs> that would probably go down quite well with <laughs> the transport using public of London. Um, <laughs> but it's, it is true that, you know, your, your voice doesn't reflect the history that you've had. Well, I love that. You say that. You say that. But to me, it does, because... Hmm. When I grew up, I grew up in the Northwest and I had a Lancashire accent, which probably comes out a little bit now when I'm relaxed and chatting and certainly comes out when I've had a glass of wine. And I went out to Mexico all those years ago with a Lancashire accent. And as I mentioned, there were 18 of us went out, 17 of them were Southerners. And I came back and my accent had changed. Yes. 
That's very but, common, isn't it? Yeah. And whilst I do, there are northern elements to my accent still. And, I, you know, when you put me in front of a microphone, certainly when I'm doing a voiceover, mm. it's that southern accent that comes yes. out. And it's that southern accent that's got me the London buses job. Yes. Um, though I did get pulled up once because I said hackney baths. Uh, <gasps> not hackney Emma! Baths. I know. Good God. I know. So, so yeah, I think it, it did, in a random way, massively influenced my future career. Yeah. And, and, and I, I often put it down a lot to luck. And I'm not supposed to say I was in the right place at the right time, but certainly to get my voice in for the testing, I just happened to be to know the person who was preparing the test who said, put your voice in, put your voice tape in. So, so that was the luck element of it. Yes. But they did test voices and, and they picked the bland one. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I'm very glad they did. Well, I'm very glad they did because it's changed my career completely. Yeah. Again, you know, I, I didn't have a voiceover studio back in those days. Mm. And it did influence where my career has headed. And the voiceovers as a business throws up so many different things every day. Yes. You know, so one day you're telling people how to fly planes. Mm. You know, and the next day you're telling a doctor how to, to use certain medication. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I love the variety of it. I, I love that. I love the fact that you go in and you're a different person for every job. Mm. You know, you, you, you're playing a part without standing on the stage and bearing your soul to the world. Yes. Um, and you don't have to do it wearing feathers. Unless you, you really want to. You don't have to wear feathers and three-inch heels because the arthritis in my toes wouldn't let me wear three-inch heels any longer. <laughs> and, and you do it, you know, I call, it, I call my studio my panic room because it is a, a sort of, you know, a padded cell in yeah. many ways. Um, and at the moment during lockdown, what an amazing thing to have in the house when you've got <laughs> well, kids around. Oh my yes. God. Somewhere to get away. <laughs> <laughs> Mummy's working, she's still working. She's been working for 12 hours non-stop. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I know. So, so yeah, it's, um, oh, it's, it's, it's lovely and long may it last. You've been listening to Tales from the Tannoy with Eleanor Hamilton and Emma Hignett with music from Beats Bakery. This podcast was produced by Carl Svensson from Tadar Media. If you're enjoying this series of Tales from the Tannoy, please subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts.